Hi guys. Um, so today we're going to be talking about uh, replacing Docker with Podman. Um, so here's the first step. You DNF install Podman. Next step, alias Docker equals Podman. Any questions? <laughs> Why don't we wait till the end for questions? <laughs> okay, so uh, this is my favorite tweet ever. Um, so up here we have, uh, I don't know if this thing will work, but Alan Morin uh, said, I completely forgot that two months ago I set up an alias of Docker equals Podman, and it has been a dream. No big fat demons, Project Atomic. And so basically he set it up two months ago, and down here Joe Thomas Thompson asks, so how, what reminded you? And then he said, I executed Docker help, and all of a sudden Podman help came up. So, um, so that's sort of a proof point, and believe it or not, that happened back in May. That tweet went on in May. So um, at this point, if you've ever come to one of my talks, you know I make you guys do stuff. So everybody up. So please read out loud any text that is in. Yes. Excellent. Nice job. <laughs> These might be all US things, but. Basically, containers is a Linux thing, okay? Docker was, was awesome. They created the idea of this uh, mechanism for storing software inside of a, uh, basically a tarball and some JSON file. So when I talk about a image or a container image, we're really talking about you create a directory on disk called the rootfs. Then I put some content in it. A rootfs is called that because it sort of looks like root on a Linux operating system, right? Usually. If you go into that directory, you have things like slash user and slash var and um, you know, slash root and slash home. Uh, so it's a root FS. You put your content into it, and then you create a JSON file associated with the image. And the JSON file has fields in it that basically describe what's going to be in your image. So it's things like uh, the environmental variables that are required to run this image or the entry point, the working directory. Things like that are in the JSON file. And then you tie that up together. And you basically take that stuff and you put it in a container registry. So CoreOS, a few years ago, you know, that's what Docker really invented. Um, and what they did is they put, um, so Docker sort of controlled the image format. But along came Rocket, I mean CoreOS, and they had this tool called Rocket. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to standardize on the image format. They wanted to basically define what goes in that JSON file. Okay, what are the fields in that JSON file? Have a standard. And why do you need standards? And anybody that's ever been around in the computer industry for the last 20 something years, or in my case, 150 years, uh, you remember Microsoft, you know, the guys, guys we now like. But traditionally, Microsoft back in the 1990s and the early 2000s, they controlled .doc. So the document, basically a standard document format that everybody was sending around the internet. And every time Microsoft released a new version of Office, they changed the standard. And all of a sudden, you would get documents in the emails, or documents on websites or whatever, and you would have to buy new software, new Office, to be able to view that document. Okay, And all the open source versions of a LibreOffice or OpenOffice, whatever it was at that time, would instantaneously be broken. Because there was no standard. There was no standard body controlling what was happening on the document. 
So CoreOS came along and they basically said they wanted to standardize that document format, standard, not document format, standardize the image format, and they opened up a, uh, a request for everybody to review this thing called the AppC spec, Application Container Specification. At which point, all the people that were working on containers got together and said, we can't have two standards for this. We, don't, we can't have RPM and Debian again. And so they basically came together and said, we have to have a standards body to define what a container image is going to be. And that standards body became OCI, Open Container Initiative. And it's a standard definition of what makes a container. So when you want to run a container on your system, the first thing you have to do is identify what the hell a container is. OK, so now we had a standards body that said this was a container. And about a year ago, the OCI image bundle specification came out that defined what goes in the JSON file and what goes in the tar file. So now we have a standard for what these things are. So when I say I want to run Fedora or I want to run Nginx, I have a standard that defines that. So now we take those container images, and we're going to store them at a container registry. Container registry is really just a website. But there's a protocol to be able to communicate with that. So we needed a, now when I want to run a container, I need a mechanism to go to a container registry and pull it to my local system, right? And um, so uh, a few years ago, Antonio Merdaka, who's someone in, in here, um, basically uh, we opened up a pull request with Docker to basically look, we wanted to pull down that JSON file that's associated with the image. We wanted to pull it to the local system to be able to look at it. Because some of these tarballs can get enormous. Right? They can get uh, you know, well over a gigabyte. Um, so what we wanted to do is basically do a Docker inspect dash dash remote. And we went to Docker, I had a pull request, and they said they didn't want to pollute the CLI. They didn't want to have these new options come in. But they said, it's just a website. Just go out there, grab the JSON file, and pull it back. So Antonio built a tool called Scopio. And Scopio was a tool for pulling down the J. Originally, it was just for pulling down that JSON file, or the OCI specification to the host and then being able to examine. Well, Antonio didn't stop there. He basically continued on and he implemented a whole bunch of protocols, like the pulling down the entire tarball. And he also implemented pushing the tarball. And eventually, this, this tool grew to be able to, be able to move container images between all sorts of different kind of container storages. So we were able to, you know, you're able to move from a, one container registry to another container registry without being root. You can move it to your local system. You can put it in a directory. You can put it, it actually can transition from different types of container images. And we're going to be talking about a thing called container storage in a minute. So now we have a mechanism. Um, oh, so CoreOS came to us, and we were trying to get to convince them at the time to use Scopio to move their container images around. And they said, we don't really want to exec a tool. We want to have a library. So we broke Scopio into two parts. So we created a new library called GitHub Containers Image. And it's all, the, it's all the source code to move container images from container registries to local storage. So now we have a mechanism to define an image and pull an image. The next thing we need is a mechanism for storing the image on disk. Container images tend to be layered images, right? You have sort of a base image, then I put a, a JBoss on top of it, and then I put, I mean, I put Apache on it, and I put JBoss on top of that. So I might have multiple layers. So in order to do that, we needed a special kind of file system called a copy and write file system to be able to store those and to build those and create those. Um, and that thing is called, uh, well, we created a separate library called GitHub Container Storage. And usually people think of things like overlay file system, device mapper, ButterFS. There's all these file systems. So we originally took the code that we contributed to Docker, and we pulled it out. We wanted to put it into a separate library so that could be developed at a different rate. So now we have the ability to define an image, pull an image, store it on local disk. The last thing we need to do is to actually be able to run the container. Okay? And what we needed is a mechanism to define what it meant to run a container on your system. Okay? And that we wanted to have a specification for that because we wanted to be able to run containers in a different way. But what you want to do is you want to take the influence of three objects and combine them together into a specification. So when I run a container, the container basically has some content. The container image, remember, has that JSON that says these are the environmental variables I have expected to be set. These are the uh, working directory I want. So we have some specification from there. Then we have a specification from the tool that's actually pulling the image. So tools like Docker and Podman basically define sort of hard code, or at least put in a config file somewhere, content that defines what it expects to be happen when you run a container. 
These are things like what security, what the SC Linux label is, what the capabilities it's going to drop, things like that, are built into the container engine tools. And then finally, we take user input. And user input just the way you override stuff, right? You say, well, I want to run a container, and I, instead of running the default entry point, I want to run bin shell. So we combine the user input, the tool that's pulling it, and the content inside the image. We combine all that together, and we write out yet another JSON file. That JSON file is now defined as the OCI runtime specification. Okay, so we have a specification. And because of that, other tools can read that specification and interpret it and do containers in different ways. So you might have heard of Kata containers, there's Run C containers, there's GVisor containers, but basically all of these guys are following the same standards, so every container engine can generate a specification and then launch whatever container engine implements the ability to read that specification. Run C was the first, is the default implementation of the OCI runtime. So it's a tool that interprets the runtime specification and executes it. Okay? Almost everybody in the world that's running containers now is running Run C. Docker uses Run C. All the tools I talked about are using Run C, Cryo, Container D, Builder. Everybody's using Run C as default to run containers. Okay? So now we have so we have the full definition of what it means to run a container, right? A definition of what a container is, ability to pull it from a container registry, ability to store it on disk, and then to launch the container. Anything missing from this? Oh, yeah. We need a couple more things. We need a standard way to set up container networks. So we, you know, once I get the container, I want to be able to you know, hook up a VPN to it. And we needed a standard for that. And CoreOS actually introduced a thing called CNI. So it's a plug-in infrastructure for running network uh, for running containers um, and pretty much Kubernetes um, and all the tools I'm going to talk about now use CNI for defining the network and allows third parties and whatever fancy networks to be able to plug in to these tools that are able to run containers. Lastly, there's a tool called Conmon that we use, Container Monitor. So after, when I run a container, I just start up the first process in the container and then the tool goes away. It doesn't have to sit there watching and monitoring the container. But we wanted something that, a little tiny program that can actually watch what's going on in the container. And that we, we created as a C program, and it's called Container Monitor or CONMON. So for every container we launch, we have a little tiny program. And this allows us to take our services down, bring them back up, and reconnect to all the containers that are running on the system. There is no big fat demon in this. Okay. I have a big thing about us. All, everybody in the world, when, when Docker came out, figured that there was only one way in the universe to run a container. And with the big fat container demon, you end up getting things like, I want to be able to run my containers in production. I want to run my containers. I want to build containers. I want to just play with containers. Well, all three of those have different security goals. And we ended up with the least common denominator of security. Right? Building containers requires a lot more privileges than just running containers does. And fooling around and developing containers requires a lot more privileges. And because we only had one way to run containers, we ended up with the least common denominator of that. So I wanted to take that, you know, basically we have those four things, we wanted to take those apart and say, let's run containers differently. Let's look at tools that can run containers differently. So one of the tools we built is a tool called Podman, Pod Manager. And Podman is a tool for managing pods and OCI containers based on the Docker CLI. So if you want to run, see what containers are on the system, Podman PS-A. If I want to run a container, it's Podman Run-T, Fedora Sleep. If I want to exec into the container, if I want to list the container images, everything looks familiar. When I'm running Podman on the system, and I'm about to do a demo, this is what it creates. This is sort of the design of what's going on in the container. There is an individual conmon for each one of the containers. And Podman creates pods, not really containers. What a pod is is a Kubernetes concept that allows you to have one or more containers in the same network namespaces or the same C groups, and basically allows you to sign those together. When I create a pod, the first thing it creates is an infra container. So an infra container is just what we call the pause container. All it does is comes up and goes to sleep. And its only real job is to maintain the namespaces. So it opens up and holds the namespace, IPC namespace, net namespace, PID namespace, and C groups. And it just sits there running. 
because if I start, if I kill that process, all those namespaces, all that identities go away. Then I run container array, which is sort of the primary. So if I just said run the Fedora container, it'll create an infra container and it'll be running a single container with the pod, with the infra container, and that is sort of the primary container of the pod. Okay. Now I can also run additional containers in there. Usually we call these sidecar containers. Okay. They're basically containers that can monitor the primary container inside of the pod. But for the most part, when you think of, most people just run a single container. But when they run it with Podman, you're actually creating something that looks like this. Anybody want a demo? Let's live on the edge. Okay. Everybody see this all right? Everybody see me typing my password? Yeah, no. Okay, so this is uh, as of I think last week we announced. Um, is there a? Oh, there is a. Oh, look at that! It doesn't even work. As of last week, we introduced 1.0 of Podman. So uh, um, I guess sort of January 14th. Uh, so Podman, as you can see, this is just a simple Podman version, and it goes out and it uh, lists you know it's 1.0 of it. You know what version of Go we built it with, and some other interesting information. Looks very much like what you get from Docker. Um, so now we show you Podman info, and uh, it scrolled a little bit off the screen, but the interesting part is actually down at the bottom. So we talked about container storage um, at the beginning of this talk, and here we are pointing to where container storage is. Um, and you can see we're using the overlay. In Podman, we use overlay. It's, it is overlay 2 in Docker, but we didn't feel like no one uses overlay, and they all use overlay 2, so we just call that as overlay. Um, and it stores it here. Um, you can see different um, information about where the content is. But above it, right here, is the interesting thing, registries. When we built Podman, we didn't believe that there was only one place in the universe to get containers. Okay? We didn't hard code, everybody has to go to Docker.io. What we wanted to do is to allow you to, like, so similar to what you do with Yum or any repository, you can list your repositories. So when you go to pull an image, with Podman, you can pull it from Docker.io or Fedora Project, from Quay, from Red Hat, from CentOS, and it'll go through and search each one of these when it's, when it's executing. So it'll figure out where your container is. So an interesting thing, if we break apart containers into sort of these, these lower level concepts and don't have to have you know, just one way of running them, we can actually do containers within containers. Okay? So what right now what I'm going to show you is another tool we built is called Builder. And I built a builder container image that I'm going to use inside of Podman to build a container. Okay, so I can actually imagine building containers. Now, everybody get off the internet so I can use this. Um, so basically, it goes out and it's building a container image um, using, as you can see, builder is running inside of the container here. Um, I've taken, I created a sort of my own storage that I'm going to put in the container I'm using. Uh, isolation Cherud, because I'm already in a container, so I don't have to use so much more container stuff. But basically, I just built a container image um, in the, um, inside of a container there. Okay, so now I'm going to, let me clean it up. So an interesting thing that uh, Giuseppe Scrivano, is he here? And a cure. These two guys up here in the back uh, did some really interesting work looking at containers, and they wanted to be able to run containers as non-root. Now, people say, oh, I can run Docker as non-root. And the way you run Docker as non-root is you open up the Docker socket to the home directory, and you allow people to communicate with it. Well, if I can communicate with the Docker socket, I have full root on the host. Okay, I have the ability to do anything I want on the host, and it's worse than giving me sudo with no password because I can destroy the logs of everything I did on the system. But basically, what we wanted to do is be able to run containers without root, and we're taking advantage of a thing called the user namespace. So here, I'm not, no longer using sudo to do this. Um, oh, please don't tell me it's going to blow up. Uh, OK, you're going to have to believe me that it works. I love failures. Uh, 
hold on here. This is why you don't run a demo on your debug machine. It's not a set and four zero problem. <laughs> There's a bug report where someone was running containers in a separate directory. And Now, is that a recovery or what, huh? <laughs> okay, so, uh, all right, that, uh, so that basically just pulled down the Alpine image as non-root, and now I'm going to run a container on Alpine. So it ran in my home directory. I just did listed the top level of the root FS of the Alpine container. Um, so I can actually show you uh, PS of the container running, uh, or the, uh, the containers in my system. Um, I can show you the images um, on the system. I just happen to have Alpine as the only thing in my home directory because you just saw I blew away my entire storage. Um, and now, but if I run sudo again, you can see that these are the images on the host. So there's a separation, right? I'm building containers in my home directory versus the containers that are on the uh, uh, existing system. So you can see there's a whole bunch of containers there. But that shows that I'm not basically doing some kind of hacky thing like sneaking you into root uh, while it's going on. Um, so, so interesting. How does this work? Um, so the demo is about to show you a tool called build a run share. And what, but when I'm running containers in my home directory, I'm becoming root temporarily. And the entire Linux operating system is set to do this, but it's taking advantage of user namespace. So I'm going to do a quick demo of user namespace. But if you go onto your you know, latest Linux type systems, anything beyond RHEL 7, and RHEL 7 will have this feature in 7.7, .7, which is coming out in the summertime, um, there's a file, not, new file on your system called uh, Etsy sub UID. And what happens in Etsy sub UID is we have a mapping that takes your, oops, wrong button, that takes your username D Walsh, and probably you guys aren't, used, aren't called D Walsh, but uh, and it basically sets up UIDs, allocates UIDs to your user namespace. And you get to control these additional UIDs. So what we're mapping here is 100,000 to your user namespace, and it's giving you 65,000 UIDs. So that gets assigned, and the next user gets the next group of 65,000. You see there's a test user here, and he starts out. And every time you use a rad onto the system, this file gets populated. When I'm running the user namespace, so here I just type builder on share, and guess what? I'm root. Suddenly I'm root on the system. And inside of this container now, I'll prove that I am root. So I'm running root in the system. So let me take a look at my home directory. All right. right now, someone's tweeting out in the back of the room that Dan Walsh has root files all in his home directory. He runs his root on his system. Okay, so it's interesting that I have all these root files on my, ho on my machine, right? Pretty stupid thing to do. But if I go into a different window, I have all the files that are owned by D. Walsh. Okay, let's look at this a little deeper. I can go into the container now, and I can do a make the test. Of course, it already exists. <laughs> make the test, and I'm going to go into CD into test, and I'm going to touch Walsh, and I'm going to chone. So now, all of a sudden, in my home directory, I've got files owned by Bin Bin. Pretty cool, huh? Let's look at what happened in my real home directory, in my outside the user namespace.
it created a file owned by UID 100,000 as bin. So if I go back into Unshare, I'll show you what happened there. So if I cat out proc self UID map, it, what it did when I started up the container, or started up the user namespace in this case, is it mapped UID 0 inside the container to be my UID. So it mapped it to 3267, which is my UID, and it said for a range of 1. Starting at UID 37, it will map one container to that. Then it started mapping at UID 1, 100,000, to the next 65,000 UIDs. So when I created a bin bin file inside of the user namespace, that's actually creating a UID 100,000 file. If I exit the user namespace now, and I try to remove Walsh, it basically is going to give me permission tonight. Because now I'm not in the user namespace, and I'm trying to remove a file that's not owned by UID Walsh. Inside of the container again, or inside the user namespace, I'm able to remove the file. So I can only remove the files inside the user namespace. So use the namespace for rootless containers is pretty cool, but I can also do some interesting stuff. Close mic. Okay, so I just created a container that's a sleep container as UID. In this case, is outside the user namespace, and in this case, I'm mapping in UID 100,000 as root inside of my container for 5,000 UIDs, and so I just created a container on the system, and there's a really cool uh, thing we've introduced to Podman that basically allows you to show the UID. So here I'm saying show me the UID inside the container as well as the host UID. So it says the container is running as root inside, and it's running as 100,000 outside. So if I look at, do the PS command to see what the process of sleep is running, it's running as UID 100,000. Now I'm going to kick off another container, but this time I'm kicking it off using UID 200,000. And I'm mapping 5,000 UIDs. So I just show you that it's running as that. Now I have the container is running as 200,000. So if the container, the first container breaks out, it's running as UID 100,000, and it can't attack the UID 200,000. So it's separated by user namespace, but we can now take advantage of user namespace. User namespace has been around for a long time, but now we can actually use it for separating containers. This is something that Docker and nobody else in the world can do at this point. Um, but we can do it with Podman. So an interesting thing uh, about Podman is Podman is a fork exec model of containers. So if we look at Etsy, uh, there's a file in your home, uh, that gets created when you log into the system. So it's put into your process level. So basically, cat proc self login UID. This UID gets set exactly when you log into the system, and it follows you everywhere. Oh boy, I'm already running out of time. Okay, uh, so basically what happens here is we can record that you, D. Walsh did something. So here I am, I'm executing sudo, that's executing podman, that that's execute. so that's basically sudo creating a root process, then I'm running podman, which is going to create a container, and then I'm catting the same file inside of the container. That creates the UID 3267. It shows you that Dan Walsh is running inside that container. If I do the exact same thing with Docker, it shows it as... 424 billion to some huge number. Well, that huge number represents as minus one. So Docker is a client server model of containers, and what happens here is it actually talks to a daemon. So there's no record that you did anything on the system because of this for, uh, client server. So why is that important? I'm going to run a container where I'm actually breaking out of the container and I'm modifying Etsy shadow on the system. Oh, God. Anyways, I guess the auditing subsystem was where I am. All right, forget it. This is just. That's why you don't oversleep. Anyways, if, 
if the auditing subsystem was working, and I can show you this later, or you can download it yourself, it would have showed you that Dan Walsh modified the SE shadow file when he broke out of the container, whereas if the Docker modified the container, it would have um, basically showed you that minus one modified the Etsy shadow file. So be because we're using a fork exec model, we have better security. And there's a deep talk later on, I think 3 o'clock this afternoon, that really goes heavily into these security features. So let's look at a couple more containers. So one of the really cool things um, uh, that was added is basically also the ability to look at the PIDs associated with containers. We can actually look at the labels associated with containers. We can actually look at the capabilities uh, whether or not SecComp is enabled, uh, whether or not the auditing subsystem. So these are all questions. You know, yeah, are my containers secure? What are they running with? So with Podman now, we have tools that allow you to look um, at different security uh, mechanisms. And again, that's going to be covered this afternoon. So let's look at pods. So we've been talking totally about containers. And what I want to do at this point is I actually want to create a, uh, a, an actual pod. So pods are groups of one or more containers. So I'm going to create a pod called pod test. And then I'm going to launch two containers inside of it. I actually created them. I haven't launched them. So if I look at my system right now, I'm running no containers. OK, so now I'm going to create a pod, right? So I assign two sleep containers to the pod. And I'm going to start the pod. And now we're going to actually, and you see there's two containers running on the system. So what happens when I start the pod is it actually goes out and starts the containers. If I want to stop the pod, it's going to stop the containers. So at that point, it, it basically stops both containers. So real quick, since I'm running out of time, I'm going to show you one last tool. OK, so we wanted to be able to um, OK, so what I'm doing here is I'm actually going to run a pod. I'm going to run a series of pods. So I'm running three different pods. So I ran three different, uh, three different pods. Each one of the pods, the first one is an automatic number generator. The second pod is a, uh, well, is a database to store the automatic generator. And the third one's a web front end. So I'm basically combining all three of these together. And it ends up launching a, an application, the web front end. It's basically showing the random number generator graphed to the de desktop. So that's basically three pods running inside a libpod. Uh, but I didn't want to, we didn't stop there. So we show you that there's these three containers running inside of the pods. And now there's a new tool called Podman Generate. I got five minutes. Podman Generate allows me to generate Kubernetes content out of the running containers. So what we were thinking is basically people understand how Docker works. What we want to do is we want to be able to create a mechanism to go from sort of the traditional Docker world into the Kubernetes world. So Podman now has a mechanism for looking at what the containers that are running on the system and generating Kubernetes GM that you can then take and directly launch into Kubernetes. So you can join. This is basically what the, the help of that is. So I'm going to generate kube. So this is basically kube YAML based off of a standard podman running of a container. So you, you can basically use the traditional Docker workflow that you, you're used to for running containers and then generate the YAML that can then be used to put inside of a container. So I'm going to generate three of these. And this was not working late last night. So we'll see if a miracle happens. So now I have, uh, now I'm going to go to Kubernetes. And I'm basically going to start generating Yeah, so it failed, but but basically, what if you had a proper Kubernetes setup, you can basically start to generate all the three exact same containers inside of Kubernetes, and then you can start playing with Kubernetes things like um, you know. You know, basically putting those containers, maybe even putting the database and the web front end on multiple different services. So it basically shows you the stuff attempting to run inside of Podman, but I mean inside of Kubernetes, and that should have worked. But at this point, I'm not doing it anymore. Uh, so we'll open up to questions. Any questions? So Podman allows you to generate containers, generate pods. Uh, pretty much do anything you want. 
Uh, sort of the most popular feature of Podman right now is running it as non-root. Everybody gets excited about being able to do containers as non-root. Uh, but basically, we believe that Podman um, is a great tool for replacing sort of your standard Docker CLI. Um, Okay, um, there, there's the rest of this presentation, but I'm running out of time. But so he's, the question he's asking is: Some people connect directly to the Docker socket and use the API. Well, Podman doesn't implement that API, so we don't implement the Docker Engine API. What we implement is a thing called Violink. So Violink is a mechanism for people to talk remotely to Podmans and launch it. So we have ability to run. We have a library for Python. We have other programs. People are doing uh, cockpit talking to Podman via this Violink API. We actually have a tool we're working on right now called Podman Remote, which allows you to run on top of a Mac talking to a Podman running inside of a VM. Um, so Podman has a full remote API. We don't intend to implement the Docker API, but we don't intend to in implement Docker Swarm, obviously, because we're Kubernetes. Um, and, but pretty much everything else, everything you would traditionally do, I would say 95% of anything you would ever do with the Docker CLI we have, and then we're going to extend. We want to extend and really get it into the Kubernetes world, so to move it into the Kubernetes world. Yep. Anybody else? Okay. Yes. Well, I just actually mentioned that. So uh, there's, there's a thing called boot to Docker. We're working on a similar thing called, you know, we're calling it boot to Podman or boot to CoreOS. And our goal is to have a client that sits on a Mac talking to a VM that's running Podman inside of it. And that's exactly what Docker does now. So there's, there's, because you're running Linux containers, you can't run Linux containers natively on Macs. Okay, and so that tool will work on both Windows and on Macs. Yes? Well, yeah, so you're asking about Docker and Compose. Our goal is not to get in. So Docker and Compose is sort of like this half, half-baked solution. Uh, our goal was actually more to go towards the Kubernetes world, so we're really working towards supporting. What we want to be able to do is to import Kubernetes YAMLs into, into Podman and be able to launch multiple pods that sort of match what the YAML is. So we're looking at more of how do we integrate better into to allow people to work, move from sort of the Docker CLI to Kubernetes and back from Kubernetes back to what they're more familiar with, with, with you know, the Docker workflow. So right now we don't intend to do a Compose. This is a fully open source project though, so if you want to do Compose type stuff with Podman, we're fully open and we'd probably accept requests you know, to do that. Yes? What is your future vision? What's my future vision? Well, I mean, we want to, we, I'd like to get to the point with Podman that it automatically runs everything in a separate username space, so for more security, because I'm a security guy. Uh, we have uh, visions of, uh, you know, better integration to, uh, you know, other tooling on the system, getting the Mac stuff working properly so you can have a developer workflow from that. Um, there's a whole, I mean, guys, there's a whole pages of, of stuff we, we plan on doing. Better integration with Cryo, so if, if you're running containers in Kubernetes, Podman interacts as well as possible with those. But Podman, Builder, Cryo, Scopio all share that same container storage, so they can all work together with their individual stuff. Yes? The list? Uh, I will post it. Um, so, um, But if you follow, we put all blogs regularly. Go to podman.io. It lists all the blogs that are available for us. It's by uh, GitHub containers slash libpod is where Podman is, is based out of. Anybody else? Okay, sorry about for the demo failing, but that's what happens with live demos. Okay, thank you very much.